Okay, so good afternoon. Thank you for joining us. I'm Michelle Dunnick, Director of Events and Investor Relations at United Way of Southeast Louisiana. United Way of Southeast Louisiana, together with the Louisiana Hospitality Foundation and Energy Corporation, are proud to support phase two of the Hospitality Cares Pandemic Relief Program, which provides legal support and counseling services in partnership with Southeast Louisiana Legal Services and the Loyola Center for Counseling and Education. Thank you for joining us today. I will now turn uh, it over to our staff attorney, uh, Constance at Southeast Louisiana Legal Services. Hi everyone, I'm very excited to be here with you today. If you've been to prior Know Your Rights courses of us, you've seen me before and we try to bring you hot topics that you need to hear now that can help you now. Um, you've heard Marie and I talk about unemployment, we've brought in tax attorneys and um, we're here to talk to you today about returning to the workplace because with three vaccines out and, and, and restaurants and businesses slowly opening up in the state of Louisiana, there's a lot of concerns and there's a lot of questions about opening up and the call back to work and what are my rights and 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 how do I navigate that? So I've tried to piecemeal something here today to give you confidence and how to empower yourself, protect yourself and your families, and how to how to basically hold your account your employers accountable to keeping you safe because that's what matters. So I'm gonna screen share right now. And I have a little PowerPoint we're going to go through. Great. Um, so as Michelle said, I'm with Southeast Louisiana Legal Services. We're free legal aid to the greater New Orleans area and surrounding parishes. If you Google us, you can find our service area. Um, for those that are economically eligible, we provide different services. I'm particularly in the Employment and Benefits Unit. Um, and I deal with employment matters. And right now there's a lot of unemployment matters that are COVID related that we particularly deal with. And I service the hospitality industry in general and I'm partnered with United Way and the Hospitality Foundation. So um, let's, I suppose we'll get right into it. Now that vaccine distribu distribution is ramping up, people are being inoculated, Hospi hospitality workers are being called back to work. And some have questions about that. So, um, We'll go right into it. And I think a, a general mindset to understand is that while there are many suggested policies and suggested guidelines and, and, and ideas on how to best open up, there are a few mandates and, and, and there's a difference there. You know, mandates are hard and fast rules. The, the restaurants have to apply to them. And then guidelines, they're suggestive, um, but they can assist you when you're advocating for your own rights and safety. So we'll go into it. Um, we're going to go over several agencies today and, and don't let it overwhelm you. I know if you Google employee rights during COVID-19, you get five times more than this, but I, I find these are the most useful to you and the, the ones that are best to serve you. Um, we're particularly going to talk about OSHA, the Occupational Safety and Health Administration, and we're also going to talk about the Louisiana um, state fire marshal, and then we're going to go into, if you need to file a complaint, how to file a complaint. So um, as of March 3rd, the state is in a modified space three for Governor Edwards. They've released that. And if you go to the governor's website listed below, it's my source for this. Um, they have a lot of they have everything lined out, basically. If you're in a restaurant, if you're in a cafe, if you're in a bar, if you're in a nightclub, this is your occupancy, this is the expectation. These are the mandatory things they must do, right? Um, and this is where you kind of get your, you know, as we like to say, black letter law, right? Um, who can be open under what terms? And businesses are obligated. They, they, they need to review this, they need to adhere to it. Um, and this is where you start advocating for your rights, because as someone that's been in the hospitality industry for 15 years, that, that spent the majority of my life in it, I don't need to tell many of the listeners that there are more rights for employers than there are for employees, and especially hospitality workers. We There's very little to protect us outside of us advocating for ourselves. So it's important to be familiar with these mandates, these government mandates based on what kind of hospitality employment you have. Um, so a particular mandate that 
I, when I talk with my friends in the hospitality industry right now is like the public must wear face mask when a business or employees must wear face mask when a business is open and they must practice social distancing and all members of the public must wear a mask or face clothing clothing when they are in public and interacting with members outside of their households. So, so if, and there's an exception there with the hospitality industry, unless they are actively eating or drinking, guests should be wearing that face mask and your employer should be enforcing that mandate. And that's, that's a big part of not spreading the virus. So as for those that work in the city of New Orleans, I feel like many of the viewers that are in hospitality um, work within the city of New Orleans. We're entering a modified phase three tomorrow. Um, NolaReady.gov has excellent um, information on what's required of your business if you're being called back to work, um, what your business has to do. Um, and then Open Safety, Open Safely has public links with the United States Fire Marshal. And those are good sources for you if you're within the city of New Orleans to find out what your employer is required to do for you. Um, and that's a good place to start. A unique thing that Mayor Contrell did with the city of New Orleans is that all non-essential businesses, and those are hospitality related businesses and organizations in the city of New Orleans must register with the Louisiana State Fire Marshal. Um, and I tried to register to see the rigmarole of it, but I don't own a business, so I couldn't fully get through it. But registered businesses, um, they receive sector specific guidelines and they have to post those guidelines and you're entitled to see those guidelines, right? They have to post them and make them available. So it's a great way to know how the state fire marshal and the governor is holding your restaurant accountable and what they need to do to keep you safe. That's the starting place of knowing your rights in the workplace. And um, if you're outside the city, I would encourage you to ask your employer if they have registered. They don't have to, but there's, really no reason not to. And there's no reason to not at least build those guidelines from the state fire marshal into their particular unique policies that protect you. So, all right, we're, I'm having calls with clients and, and people are being called back to the workplace and that opens a floodgates, a floodgate of questions. And I hope you hold your questions to the end. I'll do my best to answer them for you. I'll also provide my email address if you're not comfortable giving personal information because some of this does um some of these questions are medical related if you want to email me and ask me your question in private i'll do my best to filter through them um hospitality workers being called back to the workplace so in general if you're being called back to work and you're on some state benefit plan especially a regular benefit plan, which I'm gonna go into further, unemployment insurance, not PUA, we'll go into PUA. Um, you, you're responsible to go back to work. You risk losing your benefits, you risk losing your job. And based on OSHA, it's important to know that we're considered in the hospitality, I still say we, um, in the hospitality industry, we're, we're considered moderate exposure risk. Um, only higher than that is high exposure risk, which is, say, a medical transport truck, and then very high exposure risk medical workers. I, I don't need to tell hospitality workers you are with the general public, and they're often eating and drinking without masks, and, you know, social, social distancing is hard, especially now that we are opening occupancy up and, and, and raising the number of people that can be in the building. Um, and OSHA has guidelines for restaurant specific recommendations, you know, if it's a cafe, a bar, I would look to those guidelines to bring them to your employer and say, hey, you know, these are our policies and these are the state mandates, but this could also help. This is also a resource. Um, Louisiana's an employment at will state, which is important for two main topics we're gonna to be talking about today, but in general, an at-will state means that an employer or employee may terminate an employee relationship at any time for any reason, unless a law or an employment contract that you sign on your onboarding is to the contrary, right? So they obviously can't discriminate against you. There's, there's laws to protect you there on race, gender, sex, things like that. But um, by and large, there's very little recourse for employee, employees 
with employers at an at-will state. And that applies to calling you back to work or say not calling you back to work. They, they have the right to call back who they want, you know? So that's a, that's problematic for a few reasons and we'll, we'll go into that. Um, I, across the medical field and if, the, not the medical field, the legal field, the general saying is goes something like this, and it's what I have on the screen. It's in short, if you're medically fit for work, don't have exposure to COVID-19, and don't have a responsibility related to COVID-19. And when they say responsibility related to COVID-19, we're talking you have to stay home and care for your children because they're virtually learning because their school is closed due to COVID-19. So those specifics are teased out in the CARES Act. Um, your employer can force you to return back to work. Um, there are exceptions, but a generalized fear of being exposed to COVID-19 is insufficient. Um, and, and that's unfortunate because you know, there's a lot of anxiety and there's a lot of questions about returning back to work and opening it up and how we should open up. And um, I won't get into the weeds of that, but if you have a generalized fear that's not attached to a COVID related problem, um, you have an obligation to return or you risk losing your employment with that employer and you risk losing your unemployment benefits. And if you're offered a job that is like your previous employment, not your previous employer, you also risk losing your unemployment benefits. There are exceptions though. I know some of you on PUA are saying, wait, wait, no, I'm gonna get to that. Um, so if you have a contract that says something otherwise with your employer, I would read through that, but we both know hospitality workers are often aren't protected by a contract. They often aren't given the option to have sick leave benefits. I mean, they're one of the most underserved fields in, in our working community. Um, so let's talk about benefits. So for those of you that are on a benefit program and you're being recalled to work, um, if you're on regular unemployment, UI or PUC extended unemployment, um, you've qualified for that, right? You've been unemployed at no fault of your own. You were working in Louisiana in the past 12 months, so you have a wage base pay, base pay period. <laughs> and um, you earned a minimum amount of wages, I believe it's 1200 over the quarterly period. And you're actively seeking each work when you file your claim. Um, you qualify for benefits, but that's that's the crux here if you're being called back to work, because to receive benefits, you have to have an ongoing availability to work and do work searches. Turning down a return to work offer from a past or similar employee would typically disqualify a person from benefits. And that, and that is the case in, in most scenarios here. Um, but also know that if you turn down back to work, employers have a way to report that you refuse suitable work. Um, so let's just go through a hypothetical here. You are receiving UI unemployment. Your employer calls you, says, hey, come back. Say, hey, I don't feel safe. I, I have a generalized fear of getting COVID-19. And um, is my connection still working, Michelle? So I was breaking up. Okay, um, you have a generalized fear of getting COVID-19. They have a way to report to the workforce commission that you turn down suitable work, you turn down the option to come back. They make that report, any earnings, any weekly benefits you claim during that time could be disqualified. So you turn down and then four weeks later they report you, those four weeks, um, the, the benefits program is gonna come after you for that. It could result and a disqualification, and then it could result in an overpayment. And then, and that's a situation you don't want to be in. That's a situation where you owe the state back pay for weekly benefits. And um, so I caution you there to look through all your, your options. Now, if you're on PUA, that's a little different, right? If you're on PUA, um, you could be, so PUA in general, we've gone over this in past videos. It's for persons who are self-employed, gig workers, contractors, um, they, that lost their 
job or their ability to work due to COVID, and they didn't qualify for regular UI, right? Um, I remember when I applied for benefits in 2019, I was an intern, so I didn't have a wage base pay. So I qualified for PUA when I applied for unemployment when I was laid off, you know, but it varies from person to person. Um, but then if I were called back, I'm able and suitable to work. But if I was immunocompromised, then, you know, I'm not called back. If, 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 they're, if I'm a high risk individual, then the employer has to make reasonable accommodations for me. And if those reasonable accommodations aren't met, then maybe I don't have to come back. There's a gray area. There's a big gray area. But if, if say my children are virtually learning and I, I have to provide at-home schooling for them, I obviously can't work and that would put you in a pandemic unemployment assistance situation. So with the new legislation that was put through Congress yesterday and that will hopefully be signed by this new administration tomorrow, um, Benefits were set, set to expire March 14th, and now they will be carried through to September 6th, so Labor Day, nearly six months, and benefits are gonna continue, right? But there's gonna be a lot of questionability of who can stay on benefits, especially when work offers and return to work offers are coming in. Um, so that's kind of the overarching gist of it. So let's go into PPE. So. Obviously, you're going to need this to do your job safety safely. <laughs> and according to the CDC, according to OSHA, face masks, social distancing, and avoiding crowds is the best way for hospitality workers to protect themselves. But it's also kind of laughable when we're starting to pack restaurants. It's like, how do you expect me to social distance? So you want to make sure that you protect yourself first and then look to your employer to protect you, right? So um, reasonable accommodations by your employer would include face masks. Restaurants should already have gloves. You know, if you want to further insulate your own protection, face shields, things like that, you can go to the CDC website and they have employment specific recommendations on what you should wear. Um, make sure that when you're going back to work, you hold your employer accountable and that your employer is giving you what you need. Ask for a copy and an explanation of their COVID-19 policies, what they're doing to protect you. Most restaurants already have some. I've seen um, on hot schedules with corporate restaurants where you have to log in and say, I don't have COVID symptoms, I haven't been exposed, blah, blah, blah. You have to go through that before you can clock in for your shift, before you can show up in the restaurant physically. So ask them what they're doing, their policies are, aligned with state mandates, and then align with suggested guidelines from Louisiana Health Department, the CDC, um, and the Louisiana State um, Fire Chief. So ask them what they're doing. Hold them accountable. They're, they have an obligation under OSHA to, they have a duty of care to provide um, an environment that's free from hazard that's likely to cause death or physical injury or great bodily harm. And you know, this is a global pandemic, they are required to protect you from it. So ask for what you need to be safe within reason, ask for reasonable accommodations. So this is the biggest question. And this is the question we'll see in the news for days to come. And, and this is one of those times where I say a different attorney may give you different advice, right? Um, and different attorneys are kind of going through this right now and they're going over it. So can employers demand co uh, workers get a COVID-19 vaccine? So it's an ethical and a legal question. So there's three vaccines available right now to us, right? And the vaccines have been granted for emergency use. We're experiencing a global pandemic, but you know, Unlike the flu vaccine, it hasn't been around for two years and licensed. So it doesn't necessarily make someone an anti-vaxxer to, to question that and to have their pause. I'm, I'm not gonna get into the political or medical side of it because I have no business there, but you know, some people are reserved, some people are looking to get it. You know, I personally, my spouse and I are getting it this weekend. I, we take care of immunocompromised family members and that's our choice, but your choice is your choice. Your question is, can they demand that I get it? And um, it's probably yes is the answer um, because we're in an at-will state. So I, I'm going to 
tangle this out, but until there's more cases on it and, and more people stand up and say, hey, I don't want to get it right now, or I don't want to work with people who don't want to get it, and it's litigated in the courts, there's not a lot for employers to go off of, right? But they can hold on to that at will state caveat that kind of gives them the right to decide who they employ, right? So three days ago, the first suit was filed in New Mexico when a county requested that like, firefighters and other personnel get the vaccine. Um, and we're gonna have to wait and see how that plays out. I have a, I, I have a pretty big hunch that you're gonna see this on the news for months to come. It's, it's gonna be a big deal. Um, you know, according to the legal community across the board, the, the answer is probably maybe, um, because it's not unheard of for an employer to request that someone says has the flu vaccine, right? But the flu vaccine has been around for quite some time and it's been licensed. So um, you get in that weird, hairy position where, you know, legal professors have this one opinion, but then other legal persons see it as, unless there's a medical reason that you can't get it, similar to people who couldn't get the flu vaccine, but could, you know, provide something that said, hey, my doctor said I'll have an adverse medical reaction to getting this vaccine and must be accommodated, or I have a religious reason under civil rights to not get this vaccine, um, they have a feeling that it's going to be required. Um, and I, I hate answering a question, probably, maybe, but that is the case here with the vaccine. Um, and it will play out to come, but I think what you'll see is, and what we've already seen is employers incentivizing people to get it, which is perfectly legal. And it's perfectly legal for them to ask you if you have gotten it. And it's going to be almost a hiring chip, right? It's, it's, so it'll, it'll be interesting to see this play out in the courts. Um, so to move forward, let's say you don't re you, you're being called back to work. You've heard from other employees that's not safe or you're back at work and you don't feel safe. You, you don't feel safe for a number of amount of reasons, right? Um, you start, your starting places to start with your employer and their policies and hold them to their policies. And then if you have an HR person, go there and start internally. Um, and then you bring your problem locally if it's not being resolved. And by locally, I mean, if you're in the city of New Orleans, particularly, NOLA 311 is very interested in hearing this because they've already registered with the, with the state and they should already have their policies posted. So if they're not following those, then you pretty cut and dry thing. But if you're not local, and hypothetical here, you, I've been working in this restaurant for five years. I know what 100% occupancy looks like. They said 75, this, they are packing this place. That's, that's something I would call the state fire marshal non-emergency line for make an anonymous report. And hey, it's Saturday nights, nobody's wearing masks. This place is packed and you know employees aren't being cared for. Um, I, I would encourage that. So, but if you don't feel like you're, still receiving results because agencies are overwhelmed right now. No one, we're all tired of hearing like unprecedented times, everyone's overwhelmed, but that is the case. And if you still don't feel like your concern and your safety is being validated, the next person and the next agency I'd go to is a federal agency and it's OSHA. And while OSHA doesn't have mandates, it does have guidelines and it has very specific recommended guidelines. And if you wanna file a complaint with OSHA, you have every right to if you're um, being put in a hazardous situation, if you're not being provided PPE or if PPE is not being enforced, um, you can file a complaint with OSHA and it's very easy to do. Um, and I would start with saying, these are my state mandates. These are how they're not being respected. And then these are your OSHA policies recommended for a bar type situation. And this is how grossly negligent they're being with these recommendations. They, they, they aren't even considering them, you know, and I would, I would put in those things. So if you have questions or you want reference or to build your case, um, I would go to their website. I have it listed below and all of this is going to be recorded. So don't, I should have said this sooner. Don't scramble to write it down. It will be reshared through United Way, Southeast Louisiana. So how do I file a complaint with OSHA? Um, 
like I said, start with state mandates and then go through employment OSHA based guidelines in your complaint, like cite your cite your problems directly. And you can do it online, you can do it by fax or email or telephone. So what happens? So one, you can file anonymously or you can give your name and ask that OSHA keep you anonymous and they, they have to keep you anonymous. Um, but if you've been a whistleblower and you've talked to your employer and you've had the state fire marshal come and or call at least, then you know they, nobody's dumb here, we know who you are. Don't be discouraged from filing a further complaint because there's whistleblower safety. You have a right to be protected. You have a right to advocate for your rights and be protected and not be um, retaliated against by your employer, right? So OSHA will telephone the employer, they'll describe the complaint, and then the employee, the employer has five days to respond with how they're remedying the complaint. Um, but if they don't respond or if they don't give an adequate response, OSHA will conduct an inspection. So what I want to say here, in addition to if they retaliate in any way, if they cut your hours, if they start mistreating you at work, obviously keep a paper record, a paper trail as best you can, um, and then file a whistleblower complaint. If you're fired, for sure file a whistleblower complaint. Um, but to bring this into a bigger scope, um, we in the hospitality industry know that we don't have a lot of sick leave benefits, care rights <laughs> as employees, like the laws are built to protect employers. So we do what we do best, just like we take care of guests, we take care of each other, right? I, I love my hospitality working friends that I spent decades with in the industry, right? Like I, you know, 15 years, like they're, they're family and we know how to take care of each other. And I've seen it in the past in restaurants, advocate together. Your, your efficacy goes through the roof when you guys join together and you sit an employer down and you say these policies aren't sufficient. And, and then when you file complaints together, you, you get more effectiveness, right? So if you file a complaint with OSHA and you're, you're fired for advocating for your rights, for your safety, or if you're retaliated against in any way, like suspended or penalized, um, you can report that to the National Labor Relations Board. I hope it doesn't get to this point, but in the event that it does, um, that's a protected concerted activity. Even without a union, you have a right to band together as employees to ask for better circumstances. So I hope you don't have to get on a federal level and get to these agencies, but if you do, you're more likely to get, you know, what we like to call act right from an employer to, to protect yourselves, you know, and we hope that's the case. We hope that employees adhere to their policies and they build their policies off the guidelines. But, you know, there's also concerns that businesses have been closed for so long, eager to open up and pack a restaurant. And that's just not how it should work. So the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission is another agency I wanted to go through. And they enforce, um, genetic information non-discrimination, the American Disabilities Act, and, and, and your general overarching federal rights as an employee, right? If you, so they have, if you go to their website, if you Google them, they have an excellent Q&A webpage. I was tempted to put it on here, but it's miles long, but um, they ask you, can an employer take your temperature? And normally that would be a medical examination. It wouldn't be allowed, but under circumstances, it is allowed. They, you know, an employer ask you if you've had the vaccine. Rosia said yes, and they've decided. So if you have questions like, um, can an employer ask you if you have been tested for COVID or been exposed or if you have it? Yes. Can they ask one employee instead of all employees? Well, then it gets a little more gray. They, you know, they have to have a reasonable belief that that person has COVID or has been exposed or is symptomatic, right? And they, like, say they have an incessant cough. Um, so they kind of tease out those details and those little fine questions you might have. I didn't want to go through them all today because I wanted to save time for the Q&A. Um, but I'll, I'll open it up to the floor because I was trying to speed through it. I want to introduce myself. It's on the right. My name is Constance T. I'm a staff at SLA in Employments and Business. If you have a personalized question or you don't want to post it on a recorded video, I understand that you're welcome to email me if I can't answer your question today, which 
the questions are broad. I understand um, that's frustrating, but if I can't answer it today, feel free to email it to me and I'll, I'll do my best to get back to you. And then I've also have a list of legal directories that can help you um, if you think you need free aid, if you can't, if you don't qualify by economics needs, you can look for modest means attorneys that charge fees on sliding scale basis for your employment rights. And then if you want a quick legal answer that you think of later down the road, free legal answers is amazing. So um, Shell did provide me with a list of questions that was submitted before our meeting today, and I'll just go through them real quick. One was, can an employer force me to get vaccinated? We went through that probably because we're in at-will state, but that doesn't mean you don't have legal recourse or a legal argument that just hasn't played out yet for us to give you an assessment on. Um, can an at-will employee employment policy stop an employer from bringing back employees during COVID? I would say probably yes. Um, Do we, who do if our rights aren't being met? I think we kind of went through that. You start with your supervisors, then localities, state, federal, OSHA. Um, and then I had one that was unemployment unique, but since I'm in unemployment benefits, I'm eager to answer it. And it was why should I have to pay state taxes on unemployment if I'm unemployed? And why didn't they input state withholding? Um, so unfortunately in the eyes of the IRS and the eyes of the government, if you receive unemployment benefits, it's considered income, but it's not considered earned income, right? So if you receive unemployment benefits and you go to file your taxes, you don't get that earned income that you were expecting because it's not an earned income, but still a taxable income. So it, it kind of hurts you. It's fixed. A lot of people whose first time navigating an unemployment system, right? We had what 18 million people collecting in February in the United States. So th there's new people that haven't experienced this, and they're they're seeing their taxes and they're in shock. Um, I don't have a reason for their why they wouldn't take it out. I do know that you have the option of taking out federal taxes or leaving them and paying them later. Um, I know a lot of people needed money now. They needed money every week now and they needed as much money as they could get. And then they were gonna deal with their tax later and it was just a survival instinct. And I, it made sense that the, we're addressing these tax problems. It's it's a whole nother, but um, with the American Act that's gonna get signed by this administration tomorrow, they are doing a federal tax break on unemployment benefits up to $10,200. So it won't impact your taxes nearly as adversely for the next tax year. I know that doesn't help you for filing for right now, but next year when you're filing, there will be a little forgiveness and wiggle room there. Um, and then to go touch on unemployment benefits, uh, we're gonna tease out the full act in our next Know Your Rights, but the American Rescue Plan Act extend the benefits for almost six months. So what would have expired March 14th for PEUC regular UI recipients and PUA recipients is gonna be kicked out till um, I believe it's September 6th. Um, but that is all I had. I see there's some things in the chat. Um, what if you have asthma and they want you to repay unemployment? If it depends on what unemployment plan you were under, if you were under regular UI, there's a possibility you maybe should have been under PUA because you have a health reason for not working. But unless it's considered a qualifying PUA medical reason, um, returning to work would be required with reasonable accommodations. But then again, if you're a bartender and you have to face people, you can't really bartend from home, so they can't give you a, rec a reasonable accommodation. Um, if, you, if you're if you facing a repayment or an overpayment to, I, I can't see her name, Ms. Klusman, um, if you're facing an overpayment and you're on regular UI, I would, I would encourage you to reach out to Legal Aid. Um, 
and ask that question because that needs to be teased out more and it, and it depends on the disqualification they gave you and why they gave you a disqualification um, because that's kind of the crux of it and without knowing that that's where you go from there but know that even if you have an overpayment um, and you lose on the disqualification you can apply for overpayment waiver if you prove that there wasn't fault you didn't mis misrepresent it was no fault of your own and um, it would be a against good conscience for the judge to ask that money back of you. So you can apply for an overpayment waiver questionnaire and form. Um, and Ms. Klesman, I'm gonna reshare that slide for you. Um, but, you know, so know you have multiple bites of that. Even if you're disqualified and you don't win on the disqualification, you can apply for waiver if you have just calls. So from Michelle, Constance, do you have any advice for HR directors? Um, I don't have any particularized advice for HR directors. I'm sure it's gonna be quite a lot for them. Uh, documentation is the best way to start and familiarizing yourself with the CARES Act is also a good way to start. If you, it's 2102 of the CARES Act, if you go under the PUA qualifications, and then if you go under the mandates, I think that's a good place to start with meeting people in the middle of the road when they have questions about the policies that are enacted to protect them. Um, but I see you just posted my email. I don't know if anyone else has any questions. Um, I'm happy to answer them or if it's efficient. Normally we run over, so I went I went a little fast today in fear that we'd run over. That's um, having to figure out how to put myself back on uh, camera. So thank you so much, Constance. That was great. Um, Thanks for answering all of our uh, pre-submitted um, questions. Um, as um, uh, Constance has put her contact information up here, if you have any other questions, you can give her, send her an email or give her a call. Um, again, thank you so much for joining us. I do wanna plug one thing right now, it is tax season. So um, we do have two programs, United Way has two programs that we'd like to share. Um, we have My Free Taxes, and that is a free online tax um, program similar to maybe a TurboTax or something like that. And it's free for anyone making under 66000 um, Also, we have the Volunteer Income Tax Assistance Program, also known as VITA. And it is um, a free um, way to get your taxes done. Uh, anyone that made under $56,000 in 2020 um, or any persons with disabilities, uh, the elderly and limited English speaking um, folks are also welcome to um, apply or to submit their taxes. You literally just put a packet together, drop it off at our office or one of the other VITA sites, and then you'll, you'll just be able, they'll call you in a few days and you can go pick up your taxes. So um, hopefully um, this is, will encourage anyone that was unemployed um, this past year to save a few dollars and get their taxes done for free. Um, I also wanted to plug our uh, Loyola, Loyola, Loyola Center for Counseling and Education. Um, we have uh, low cost um, counseling services, therapy, family therapy, group therapy for hospitality workers in particular. Um, a lot of these are done online right now due to COVID, but um, therapy is, um, you can have therapy for as little as $10 um, a session, which is pretty amazing. And all of this information can be found at hospitality, United Way, SELA.org, backslash hospitality cares resources. So let me try that again. United Way, SELA.org, backslash hospitality cares resources. And it also has information, it has uh, conferences information on there as well, as well as um, upcoming events. Um, our next event will be um, next month and we will be discussing, what will we be discussing, uh, Constance? I'm like, We're gonna be discussing the act that's hopefully gonna be signed tomorrow by the new administration, the American Rescue Plan Act. So that's a $1,400 check that's extended benefits with stimulus to the extended unemployment benefits and what they mean to you. Wonderful. And we'll send an email out. And thank you so much. We'll send the recording out as well. Thank you so much for joining us. I hope you guys have a wonderful Thursday. Thanks, guys. Stay safe.